Today, we are continuing our dive into orbital maneuvering with the contract position a satellite in a polar orbit of the moon. Clearly, this is going to require us getting our first Moonar capture of this series, but also our orbit contains a parameter we haven't seen yet, the longitude of the ascending node. So we'll be spending a bit of time talking about how to efficiently deal with that. This will also be a science mission, and we'll be using the science archive the game provides to help us plan the what and where of our collecting. And, as this probe will not be returning, we'll be taking a closer look at transmitting science, specifically the electricity costs, which can sneak up on you. Let's get started. Looking at the contract here, position satellite in a polar orbit of the moon, and we'll Go and take a look at these objectives. Please note that this must be a new unmanned probe built for the Strutco after the contract is accepted. So once again, with all of these inserting satellites, they have to be new vessels. You can't take old satellites and move them over there to satisfy the contract. So taking a look here at our orbit specifics, we have a specific apoapsis, a specific periapsis, a specific inclination of 90 degrees, that is what makes it a polar orbit. More on that once we complete the mission. But we have two more here. We have the argument of the periapsis, which we looked at last time, which is 10.1 degrees. Again, the number itself doesn't really matter. Don't worry about what it actually means. But the practical upshot of it is that we need to get the periapsis in the indicated location. It has to be in a very specific spot. But we also have this longitude of the ascending node. Oh, again, what does it mean? Don't worry about the number. What it means though is that the ascending node needs to be also in a specific spot. So actually, when you take a look at all five of these parameters together, this means you really do have to match exactly the orbit that is shown in the animation. And we'll talk about how we're gonna do that as we progress through the mission. Going through the rest of it, it has to have an antenna, has to be able to generate power, that's there pretty much all the time. Uh, you have to f have it fully assembled at launch. Uh, you must hit that designated orbit with marginal deviation. Again, there is some leeway that's given to you. You have to have a mystery goo unit aboard the satellite. Those are the things that are really easy to miss, so make sure to check that out. And then, of course, we do have to keep stability for 10 seconds to make sure we're not cheating this thing. Nice payout, both in science, reputation, and in cash. And I picked up one more as well, uh, science data from space around the moon. All we got to do is transmit or recover some science data from space around the moon. We're going to be around the moon anyway. Always pick up the free ones, so this one's also going to be satisfied at the same time. Okay, so let's get back out here and we're going to go into research and development. I'm not going to unlock new tech, but I'm going to take a look at a tab that's easy to miss up here at the top left, the archives tab. This is a really useful tab. It's showing you all the science that you have collected thus far. And it's, you know, a reasonable amount here that we have all collected, even though we're still fairly early in the game. But it's also nicely organized here for you in terms of what experiments we've done. And you can, for instance, click on crew reports. There's all the crew reports that I've done. Or clicking on situations, you know, all the ones I've done, surface landed, surface splashed, etc., like that. And over here, organized by body. Uh, we've only been Kerbin and the moon. You might not see the moon here. Well, that's because the moon is a satellite of Kerbin. So if I go over here, here we are. This is the science that I have to date collected around the moon. And the thing to notice about this science is if you go down, all of it is high space, space high over the moon, all the way down. There is no near space around the moon. Everybody has both high space and near space with varying boundaries. For the moon, that boundary is about 60 kilometers. If you can get below an altitude of 60 kilometers above the moon, you enter into near space, and that is a whole new situation for you to collect science in. Now, the orbit that's required of the contract actually is completely in high space, but I want to take advantage of the fact that we are going to be around the moon it's not going to cost us much to go to near space first. So that's what we're going to do. The plan is going to be to science up this probe, 
get into near space, collect all the science that we can with it, and then insert it into the final orbit. So there's going to be a lot of orbital shenanigans for you to watch in this one. And we'll start this once again with the Probodyne Octo Probe Core, and then this does require an antenna, so we'll go here to communication. We have the Communitron 16 and 16S, which we have used in previous builds, but I'm going to use a different one here. The HG-5 High Gain Antenna, and what makes this one different is its antenna type relay. The other two antennas are direct antennas. Uh, and what that means is, is that they need a connection to the KSC in order to function. But the relay antenna, which also obviously needs a connection to the KSC, but has the ability to take a signal from somewhere else and relay that to the KSC, something that will definitely be useful to have around the moon, though this is hardly going to be in a very good relay orbit. There is a whole video's worth of topics when it comes to constructing relay networks so that you can have reliable communication. And you can check out my video that's coming up there and it's probably going to be something that I'll explore later in this series as well. For now, this will be a poor man's relay. We might as well put these on here and make this work. And we're going to put on two because it turns out that two of these is gives you a nice relay strength when it comes from the moon to Kerbin. And again, if you want to take a look at relay strength and all the math that's behind it, there's a video there for you to take a look at. I'm going to spin these around. Let's see this way. Yeah, I like them like this and they deploy nicely too. They look good like that. Oh yeah, that looks great. Okay. So there's our antennas. Now one thing before we get any further with the antennas, I want to take a look down here at electricity. For most of the things in KSC, you don't have to spend too much attention to electricity, but there are a few things that can be rather electrically expensive, and transmitting science is one of them. Let's go down here where it says requirements, electric charge, 51.4 units of electric charge per second. That's a lot. now. Note it says when transmitting. So it's only when it's transmitting, not just when it's on and you're just communicating, but when you're actively transmitting science, these antennas are gonna consume 51.4 units of electric charge per second. Now, to give you some idea of how much that is, if we go over to our electrical section and take a look at our oxstats, um, they generate each 0.3 units of electric charge. So if you want to cover that 54 units of electric charge per second, well, you're going to need a whole lot of oxstats. You're not going to do it that way. It, it would be ridiculous. So what we're going to do instead is put on batteries to cover that electric charge so that if we go back here to communication, while it's transmitting, it will use the electric charge that's stored in the batteries. Now the question becomes, how much batteries do you want to put in? Well, it's actually not too hard to figure it out. First, you got to estimate how much science do you think you need to transmit and estimate on the large side. And a good place to go is back to that archive. Take a look at the science that you've already collected and take a look at how much science there was there and then get an idea of how much science you're going to plan on collecting on this mission and estimate how much science you're likely to transmit and estimate on the large side. I'm going to estimate 50. There's no way we'll be transmitting as much as 50 units of science at a time, but it's a good nice round number. So let's go with 50. If I take my 50 science and I look up here and look at bandwidth, bandwidth here is 5.7143 mits per second. This is completely unclear, but a mit is a science point. Don't worry about the packet size, that doesn't matter. It's this mits that's a mit is a science point. So you can sit there and say, oh, okay, this antenna can then transmit 5.7143 mits per second. And you might be thinking, oh, you got two of them, so that means you can do twice. No, it doesn't work that way. What the game does is it looks at your probe, picks the best antenna for the job, and it uses just that one whenever transmitting. So this probe was capable of transmitting 5.7143 science points per second. Okay, take the 50 science points that we have, divide by 5.7143, and that gives you how many seconds you're going to spend transmitting that 50 science. Okay, 
and then multiply that by the 51.4 and that will give you how much electric charge you will consume while transmitting those 50 science points and for this probe that comes out to be about 450 electric charge so make sure you have that aboard and in fact if anything estimate on the high side of that so you're sure to have enough electric charge so let's see i would like to get i'm going to go with 600 really estimate uh, batteries aren't heavy don't worry too much about it so my biggest battery is the z200 it holds 200 units of electric charge so we're going to put on one we're going to put on two like that okay that's 400 i could put on a third one but this is getting a little bit uh I like them to be compact, so for aesthetic reasons, I'm actually going to finish this off with a two Z100s, which are 100 each, so that's another 200, and we're going to put on two of them like that. So there's my battery collection. Okay, let's keep going. That should take care of all the transmitting without any worries whatsoever. Okay, we're going to now put on some solar panels. And I did the same thing I did with the last probe, using six-way symmetry to surround the probe with solar panels. And I used the move tool because the solar panels were clipping just a little bit because the diameter of the battery is just a little bit smaller than that of the probe. But I don't like this either, this solar panel clipping right into the battery. I would love to remove this solar panel. But if I remove this, I'm going to remove all of them because they're all on the same symmetry group. But if you right-click on the solar panel, Notice there's a button here saying remove from symmetry. Now this solar panel's by itself. I can grab it, pull it away without affecting the others. Great, and now the battery's in the little hole that's left behind, I like that. And I can do the same thing with this one. I'm gonna right click, remove symmetry, and then take that one away. And it'll run fine just on these two solar panels. Uh, it doesn't need a lot of electricity. And let's see, if I fold these back up, does it still look good? Well, I think it does. I am very, very pleased with that. On to science. Remember that the contract does require me to put on a mystery goo. I decided not to put on a materials bay. It's a lot of mass and you can't transmit much of that science anyway. So I decided to just let that one go. But I did put on, of course, a thermometer and a barometer. And that finishes off the science that I have available. So now it's time to start thinking about propulsion. And if we're going to think about propulsion, we've got to think about budget. How much Delta V do we want on this thing? Well, if you go to the Delta V maps, you will see that it takes 860 meters per second to get yourself out towards the moon. And then if we take a look, our next number here is 280 meters per second. That's to get a capture around the moon. Now that's a capture at an altitude of 14 kilometers we're gonna be capturing at a very different type of an orbit, but turns out around the moon, that doesn't affect things hugely. Now you can get into the math of all this if you want, there's another video for you to collect, or you can do what I did last video and plan out the whole mission using maneuver nodes to try and figure out what this is going to cost you. That will work particularly fine. But I know that the 280 is actually not too bad. Now we should estimate up. Number one is we are gonna be doing some orbital shenanigans, so that's gonna cost us a little bit more. Also, you often will get contracts to move these satellites around. Moving them around the moon is not as expensive as moving them around Kerbin because the moon has a lower gravitational field than Kerbin does. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna arbitrarily add on another 300 to this and then the 3,800 meters per second for getting into orbit to give us a total budget of 5,240 meters per second. Okay, so I would love to cover the 1440 meters per second part of this with just the probe, but it was very obvious very quickly that the single Oscar B fuel can wasn't gonna be enough, so I put on two of them, but then with just one ant engine, I only had a thrust to weight ratio of 0.25, which will work, but I don't want the burns to go a little quicker than that, so I simply doubled up the ant engine. Now this isn't without its problems. Number one is, I, I don't like, I like my probes to be as kind of compact as I can, and this is starting to look a little bit long, a little bit goofy. That's a personal choice, it's not as big a problem. But the other one is that if I take a look, let's see if I try to attach a decoupler on the bottom of this. Let's get our stack separator here. I start to get Lotus, like, I do have access to the center node here, but 
this is like you know the engines actually protrude below the decoupler that means I'm gonna get some clipping when I try to put the booster underneath that that could be problematic if I go for you know I start to get now I got two decouplers if I try to force it to go to one now the one decoupler is off to the side this is good this is kind of problematic this whole way this is here at the bottom so here's how we're going to fix all of this I'm gonna take this one off temporarily I'm gonna take all of the oxidizer and liquid fuel out of this one the, and then and then I can turn off so that I make uh, we can these cannot hold fuel anymore this turns this into more of a structural part rather than a fuel part now you can actually go over here and take a look at how much this weighs if I take a look at the Oscar B fuel can it has a mass of 225 kilograms but most of that is fuel over here we have the fuel mass and the oxidizer mass point uh, 90 kilograms of fuel and 110 kilograms of oxidizer those add to 200 so that means only 25 kilograms of this is the actual tank itself the, what it's called it's dry mass so what I've done here is turn this just into a 25 kilogram structural part I think that's gonna be fine then I'm gonna take this tank we're gonna go on to here and we're going to turn it to be sideways so it's like that and I don't want four of these engines I only want two of them but you know what I'm gonna stick it off to the side here just a little bit we'll get to that in just a little bit now this is looking rather wide now so instead I'm gonna take these and we're gonna flip them that way oh that's looking like oh this is now looking like a thing slide this downwards and now I'm getting a nice little kind of you know these guys here are full of fuel right with their oxide I still got two tanks where I got a 25 kilogram structural part just to kind of help with all of that and then I'm gonna take these two engines and I'm gonna stick them down put the snap on we want to make sure they're pointing straight down I'm gonna stick them down there maybe take the move tool slide them up a little bit that's now looking like I think a pretty groovy looking probe uh, I still got 1917 meters per second that's plenty 0.47 thrust to weight ratio I think I got something that to me looks pretty good I of course then added on my customary blinky lights as for the booster it is almost the exact same booster as last episode started with the stack separator then underneath that went small reaction wheels and then the fairing and instead of three I have now four FLT 400 fuel tanks with a swivel underneath and then four basic tail fins for stability and then after tweaking the thrust to weight ratio down to my customary 1.33 this thing was ready to launch and as this is our second trip to the moon I don't want to repeat everything that I said in that previous video if you need that information you can go back and check that video out a couple of key points though number one we're going into a pretty standard 80 kilometer parking orbit about Kerbin and I am paying very close attention to my heading the moon is in an orbit with an inclination of zero so I want to keep my heading as due east as possible and that is a heading of 90 degrees and while we watch this ascent I want to welcome aboard my most recent patreon patron Louis Slothuber thank you very much Louis for your most generous support and of course that thanks extends to all of my patreon patrons and YouTube members there are links down there in the description if you want to join this most illustrious group. And setting up our transfer out to the moon, it's always just a little bit under 860 meters per second to get out to the moon. And then we'll shift our view here to the moon. This is the orbit that we're aiming for, so we have to pay attention to our trajectory coming in to help us get into this orbit. So what we're going to do is we're going to select here our maneuver and we're just gonna pump ahead a little bit in time and the plan right now is to just kinda hit the moon smack dab in the middle and you can take a look at our trajectory and this is predicting our trajectory going out as if the moon was like just some tiny little point with the same mass if you take a look at this if you can get the outgoing trajectory to be matching up with the ingoing trajectory that means you're hitting it right in the middle when you take a look at it from the top so what I'm gonna do actually I think I need to add a little bit more prograde yeah 
So there you go, that's pretty much a direct hit towards the center of the moon. Now, of course, that is not going to be our plan. Our plan is to enter into this polar orbit. So after we perform this part of the burn, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a mid-course correction. About halfway along, we're going to add another maneuver and we're going to add some normal to this maneuver. We're gonna pull our trajectory upwards upwards on the screen, it's actually northwards as far as the direction. And notice the effect that that's happening, right? We're no longer hitting the moon, we're gonna be coming above the moon. Now, if this contract did not have a longitude into the ascending node and an argument of the periapsis, all that you needed to do is match this apoapsis, this periapsis, and this inclination, then that means you don't have to actually match exactly this purple or orange orbit, not purple, orange orbit. <laughs> Instead, you just need to get these numbers right. So the way to do that would be to simply take this second maneuver and get the periapsis right. It's actually a little bit cheaper to do the periapsis first and then do the apoapsis. Periapsis needs to be about 161 kilometers. That would be close enough right there. And then what we need to do is get what's called our capture. Now, right now, we're coming around the moon, but we're going pretty fast and our speed is so much that the moon's gravity can't get a hold of us. It can bend our trajectory, but it's not gonna slow us down enough to be actually captured. Instead, what we're gonna be doing is leaving the moon's SOI and going off somewhere else. So what we need to do is to slow ourselves down at this closest approach. So that means another maneuver at periapsis and we need to slow down. So this maneuver is going to be a retrograde maneuver. And as we slow down, we can get ourselves to the point where the moon's gravity will keep us close to the moon and we get ourselves a capture orbit like this. Now our apoapsis needs to be a specific number. What is it here? 298 or thereabouts. So we just keep going in that direction retrograde until we get to 298. Right about there. That's close enough. And so if, Again, the longitude of the ascending node and the argument of periapsis weren't there. This would be good enough. We could get this capture. It would get the right uh, apoapsis, periapsis. The inclination would be pretty darn close. If not, if it doesn't quite work, we can tweak that afterwards. That would satisfy the contract. The problem is we do have a longitude of the ascending node and we do have an argument of the periapsis. So we do need to match this orange orbit precisely. Now, one thing we could do is we could go down, let's do a node uh, that's far away from what we've seen so far. Down here where the two, our orbit and the target orbit crosses. Up at the top, we've got too much going on already. I don't want to, but if we clutter that up up there any further, if we move this so it's right here, I can see that, oh my gosh, this orbit's coming along this way. So we need to take the normal part and we need to bend it, Oop, not that way, this way so that they end up matching. Notice that that's messing up my argument of periapsis and apoapsis and stuff like that. But this becomes crazy expensive. If we take a look at this fourth maneuver here at its details, I've already put in another uh, 327 meters per second. I can't, I can't afford to do, I gotta do still some other fixing. But this is starting to get really, really complicated. So that's not what we're going to do. There's a simpler, and free thing to do. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete these last three nodes that I made and boop, go back to just our ejection out here. The problem is that our initial ejection is, there's an angle here. We would like this angle to be small as possible. If this angle is as small as possible, that means that any inclination change we need to make will be minimal. How can I decrease this angle for free? It's easy. All you have to do is select the maneuver and go over here to the graphic maneuver editor and go forward in time. Now, I don't want to actually start grabbing this and moving it because that's going to mess everything up here. What I'm instead going to do is just go to the next orbit. Notice down here under orbit, there's a little plus and a little minus button. The minus button is grayed out because I can't go backwards in orbit. I would go backwards before where my craft is but I can go forwards in orbit. So what happens if I do that? In fact, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that five times. So that's two, three, four, five. 
And notice that that does mess things up a little bit because the moon is moving around in its orbit. So what we need to do is just use our little uh, timer tools to get that timing again exactly right. But what I want you to notice here is that this angle has changed. This angle has actually gotten bigger, right? But the key is it has changed. Why has it changed? Well, because this orbit in its orientation in space remains exactly the same. If we sort of imagine a, an, a line coming out of the plane of this orbit perpendicular to the orbit going this way, it would be pointing to some star way out there. And that direction remains exactly the same regardless of what the moon does. So it's going to remain pointing in that exact same direction because of the physics of conservation of angular momentum. But the moon is moving. The moon is constantly changing its orientation as it goes around Kerbin. So it's not this orbit that's moving. It's the moon. But the end result is the same. Our trajectory angle with our target has changed. So what I can do is just keep popping ahead orbits. Let's go another five. And again, fix the timing of it. Whoops, missing my arrows. And notice that now we're coming in. This is getting worse, but if we keep going, it's going to start getting better on this side. So again, another five. One, two, three, four, five. Fix the timing. And this is costing me absolutely nothing in terms of fuel. It's only costing me time. Let's go another five. And the reason why I'm going ahead only five is because if you go ahead too many, this ends up leaving the moon's SOI altogether. And then it's a little trickier to set back up again. So we'll go five, go bring that back. And we're going to keep going until our incoming trajectory is right over top of our orange orbit. Again, changing the timing a little bit. If I put a little bit more prograde into it. And what I'm really looking at is this incoming one, not the outcoming one. Let's fix the timing a little bit. So I add a little bit of prograde, not much. And that means I'm getting there a little bit faster. I can get that. Oh my gosh, look, okay, there we go. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, how much you want to spend doing this is completely up to you. I get very picky about it, but I like to minimize this. So now what we're doing is it's coming in here and it's going to be right along the plane that we want. So we will not have to make much, maybe a tiny little inclination change, but it's not going to be much. All right, let's do this burn. Now, because of all of our orbit hopping, the burn is two days and two hours into the future, but that's not a big deal. That's just time warping around Kerbin a bunch of times. And don't forget, the game does have a built-in alarm clock that you can use to stop this time warping at the appropriate time. I also tweaked down the thrust limiter on that main booster because its thrust to weight ratio was rather berserk. Okay, here we go. Three two one and go and of course we're going to be on this for a little bit but not too long see on that it's now nice and control but we're going to be losing it in a moment anyway and now we're on to the lanes nicey nice i'm going to switch our view over to the moon and watch this from here because this is what's important I'm going to slow down here towards the end. And what I'm really watching, of course, is our incoming trajectory. And I want it to match right on top of that orange orbit. Here it comes. So I'm not really watching the maneuver node. Really watching that trajectory coming in. I'm going to cut the throttle. Boom. How'd I do? I'm pretty, very, very pleased with that. Okay. So, as before, we're not going to be hitting the moon, of course. We're going to be performing a correction burn way about halfway along here. And we're going to burn 
in a normal direction to Sora, we don't hit the moon. But here's where you really, there's a very easy mistake that you can make here. You really have to pay attention to the direction of the animation on this orange orbit. You see, I could burn towards the north or I could burn towards the south. But if I burn towards the north, if we take a look, here's our incoming trajectory. If I bring that towards the north up to here, we'll be coming in this way and notice that we are going in the wrong direction. We are going to be a 180 degrees out from the orbit that we want. Our longitude, the ascending node, will be completely on the wrong side of the planet or on the wrong side of the moon in this particular case. Very easy mistake to make. So pay attention to this animation. You can see, oh, if we're coming in, we need to be at the south of the moon here. So we're going to use the southward anti-normal direction we're going to be pulling it in this direction like that all right so there we go that's the way we want to go let's click on our periapsis here now i just sort of eyeballed you know about halfway here it's nice to get this in the exact the exact timing doesn't matter too much but you can play around with getting this into the most efficient spot you want to get as much southward motion on this trajectory as you can for the least amount of fuel so if we let's turn up the time interval to like 100 seconds not not nothing too and if i click say in this direction move it forward 100 seconds notice that my periapsis with the moon's gone down so without adding any more fuel i'm actually getting more bang for my buck so let's keep going in that way and see what is the best? Let's see how low I can get it here. Oh, oh, it's starting to. You can see it starts to make not too much of a difference here, so don't get too picky about it, but this is about as low as I am going to get. Now, if you were going for just this flat out trajectory, what's your best way to do it? Well, don't take a look at your periapsis number because notice the two periapsi are nowhere near each other and we do have a specific argument of the periapsis to match. We do need to get our periapsis to here. We're not gonna do this with this correction burn. The right thing to do is actually to adjust this burn. Let's put this onto the maneuver so that the incoming trajectory just touches the orange orbit, like that. That would be your thing. And then here's where you would make your capture. And then you would do the kind of radial stuff that we talked about last episode to get your periapsis and apoapsis into the right spot. However, remember we do have a secondary plan here to collect some near space science around the moon. So what we're going to do instead is not go straight for this orbit, but instead, to bring our periapsis down to about, I'm gonna go for 20 kilometers. 60 kilometers is the boundary between high space and near space. So 20 kilometers will give us a nice window of time to collect all that science, easy peasy. And then we'll manipulate this into getting our orbit that we want. Alrighty, we're a little over a minute away. Put this onto our maneuver icon here, which is right on the anti-normal direction as well and we're going to watch this from here let's take this off and we're aiming to get our periapsis down to about 20 now if you want to you can wait for this start burn time to get right down to zero but remember how little you know jumping around 100 seconds made while we were setting this up so you don't have to do that in fact I don't know, i'm about almost 40 let's just do this right now there is no urge, and you can take your time. There's no rush, I'm just gonna give a little bit of throttle. You can tweak back and forth and play with it. You can see our trajectory, and we are just... I'm gonna wait for it to just peek out here. There we go, and then I'm gonna right click on that moon periapsis, making sure to get the right one, and we're just gonna go until that says about 20. And it doesn't have to be precise, it doesn't matter if you want to keep playing with this. If you overcooked it, just spin around the other way and turn it back. You have all the time in the world to kind of fix this up. Okay, we are on our way there. Let's get ourselves to the moon. Now what we need to do is get our capture. So again, we are going way too fast. We're going to swing right by, by the moon. Don't want to be doing that. So what we need to do is slow ourselves down so the moon can capture us. And we do that right at our closest approach here at Periapsis. We're going to give ourselves some retrograde. 
slowing ourselves down. And there we go. We got ourselves a capture. However, we also want to facilitate our insertion, our eventual insertion into this orange orbit. So what I want to do is bring down this apoapsis, not to match this apoapsis. Again, we'll be fiddling with that with radial burns, but to just get this trajectory to just touch the orange one. So we're going to keep going down. Yeah, I'm happy with that. All right, well, let's get down there. But before we do the burn, we got some science to do. As soon as we're under 60, we are in low space. Or near space, <laughs> whatever way you want. So log temperature scan. We got a temperature scan in while in space near the moon. And we're going to be transmitting that. So we transmit that away. There we go. Uh, that contract is now complete. We'll do a pressure scan. Transmit that one away, and we will do a mystery goo. Now you can really see, like, if I collected it, it would have been 30 science, but the transmitting is only 12.6. But yeah, I, I'm not getting this back, so we will. It even gives you a warning about this. You won't be able to do this again. Okay, that's fine. How did our electricity hold up after that? We used up about a half of our electricity, a little less than that. Again, it's good to budget on the... Batteries are not heavy. <laughs> it's good to budget on the happy side of that. All right, so that contract is now done. Now it's time to do our orbital insertion business. Three, two, one, and go. There we go. We're off. And again, once I want to take a look at this from map view, I really want to pay attention to getting the top of this trajectory to just be touching. Okay, here it comes. Let's reduce this. Reduce our throttle a little bit more. And do a little more. There we go. I think that looks better. Let's see? Ah, happy with that. Now, if, by the way, if you take a look at our blue trajectory, notice it is a little bit off. Now, for me, I'm more than close enough. I, I, I don't have any quant. But if you want to really fix this, the actual right place to do it is about you know, from here to here, to go about the halfway point, about here, take a look at your maneuver. When you're in these polar orbits, it can get a little bit confusing, but actually this sideways, you can see, is a normal, right? And if I pull it a little bit that way, I can't affect my trajectory in that direction. I'm going too far just to make sure that people can see it. And it's not much of a burn to do that. I'm not, well, you know, no, I'm not going to bother doing it. But if you need to do that, just do that. But I'm not going to bother because I know that I'm close enough. What I'm going to be doing instead is adding a maneuver right here where these two orbits are touching. And I need to accomplish a couple of things with this maneuver. Number one is I need to increase my periapsis. So that means adding more energy to the burn with a, with a, por uh, with prograde. But what I also need to do is get my, periapsis and apoapsis into the right spot. Now I'm noticing it's happening to come really close as it is. I got I got kind of lucky. So I'll mess up this orbit just a little bit so people can clearly see how the radial part works. When you're adjusting things with the radial part, you are changing the values of your periapsis and apoapsis, but what you're not changing is the semi-major axis, which is the average between the two. So the right place for you to have your prograde retrograde part is so that the apoapsis and the periapsis are the same amount off from their targets. Let's really exaggerate this so people can see this, okay? So if I can get the apoapsis and periapsis to be off by the same amount where the periapsis is too low but the apoapsis is too high but it's about the same amount each way that's looking pretty close i'm doing that just with the prograde and the retrograde see that that means that my semi major axis the average between the two is pretty close to what it's supposed to be for the orange orbit then i can use just the radial part is this nope that's the wrong way to pull these into the right spot without changing the semi-major axis. Now the periapsis and the apoapsis are almost right now, because it's some eyeballing and bolt. And again, you don't need to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. 
Oh, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm stopping. I'm stopping. <laughs> That's more than close enough. So once you get your periapsis in the right spot, that means that the argument of the periapsis part of this is taken care of. The longitude of the ascending node is where the ascending node is well, it's its longitude, but again, that's just about its position, and that's automatically in the right spot if you are matching the plane of the orange orbit. So basically, this one burn here, the 60.1 meter per second burn, or 60.6 .6 meter per second burn. Notice I still have 980 left. I got lots of, I got lots and lots of fuel left to do further tweaking if I want. Three, two, one, and go. And again, I'm really going to be looking at the contract. Let's get the right one here. And when this slow down right now, we're almost done. But when the orbital parameters go green, that's what I care about. So we'll slow. There we go. Cut the throttle. And that's it. And while I wait the obligatory 10 seconds for the contract to complete, let's go over the main takeaways from this episode. Number one, transmitting science can use a lot of electricity, but you can calculate how much by looking at the electrical data of the antenna in the VAB. I then looked at how to do a polar insertion about the moon if I don't have to worry about the argument of periapsis or the longitude of the ascending node. If you do have to match these parameters, then you need to match the plane of the target orbit. The easiest and cheapest way of doing that is to simply jump ahead orbits with the injection burn until the incoming trajectory is in the right plane. Finally, I once again looked at the magic of a radial component to a burn to move your periapsis and apoapsis to where they need to be. And with that, I'm drawing this episode to a close. Join me next week when I'll be rescuing our first couple of cribbles from space. I hope to see you then.